Good morning and welcome to Experience Analytics. My name is Andy Gould. And I'm Natalie Williams. And welcome to our fifth Experience Analytics event, brought to you this time from our virtual world. This isn't quite what we were expecting when we set out to deliver our fifth series of Experience Analytics this year, but we're really delighted that you can join us in our virtual world to help explore some of our client challenges. Also, made me realize that I needed to put makeup on for the first time in six months. Me too, plus first time I can get out of shorts as well. This year, we're gonna bring you five inspiring episodes brought together with some of our key clients, some of our key vendor relationships, and also the Deloitte know-how. The nodes of insight that you can see floating around us represent some of the um, solutions and client challenges that our community have been facing this year. We're gonna delve into those nodes, explore those further, and help to relay back what some of those learnings and solutions are. So, shall we get started? Episode one's all about the railway network and what Network Rail has been doing with Google and Deloitte to improve simulation of rail passenger movements. So let's hand over to Andrew for Network Rail, Paula from Google, and Nadine from Deloitte. Thank you, and hello. I'd like to start with a little story. Once upon a time in a land not too far away from here, there was a woods. And in that woods lived Goldilocks. Goldilocks looked after the woods, but not all was well with the woods. Often there was too many visitors and Goldilocks needed to find more space. The plants, they would get sick and needed to be fixed. The trees, half of them were so old they were in danger of falling over and they needed to be replaced altogether. Despite the plants and the trees doing their best, overall the performance of the woods was getting worse. But not all was lost. For also in the woods lived a family of bears and the bears could make things better. However, Goldilocks needed to feed the bears with porridge. Not so much porridge that was hot and sweet, it couldn't be used. Not too little porridge that was cold and bland and didn't mean anything. Goldilocks needed to feed the bears porridge that was just right. <laughs> Thank you for listening to my story. And I can appreciate the woes of and challenges of the railways are no fairy tale. We need more capacity, we need better performance, and we need to replace our aging infrastructure. Even before today's extraordinary times, the railways needs to do a lot more with a lot less. That means a much more digitally enabled workforce. It means far more automation in the way that we operate and leveraging the value that's offered to us by data centric technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning whilst doing things like using virtual environments to prove our designs, to test our operations, and to learn more about how to make things better. All of this needs to be achieved whilst the world of operational technology and information technology is rapidly converging. In my journey in this space, I have been privileged to work with some amazing, talented people. In a recent project, I set the challenge to prove a data model for the railways and to understand the data quality values that would deliver performance. In short, I wanted to understand the data that was just right for the railways. Nadoon. Thank you, Andrew. And in Andrew's fairy tale, I guess I'd probably be the bear, right? But I can tell you now, it was no fairy tale in solving the problems that Andrew and Network Rail asked us. Network Rail asked us to look at and to improve two areas of their business. One is to improve the ability to test timetables before they're released into the real world. At that point, there were no other solutions that allowed Network Rail to test the viability and the robustness of timetables before being released into real service. The second area was to test the criticality of assets. Now by assets, I mean the track that you see on, on a network, the signals, 
and all of the infrastructure that goes along with it. Whilst asset management does a good job in, based on the condition of an asset to apply maintenance, there hasn't been a solution that can ut look at the utilization of that asset and the condition and to combine them to predict the criticality of that asset and especially in the event of a failure, the impact that that particular asset could have on the operations of the railway. So in trying to solve this issue, we had to grapple with a number of different aspects of this problem. One was the size of the data set that we needed to deal with. Both the timetable information and the actual train running time volumes of data combined with the asset information meant that we needed to process over 5 billion data records within a matter of seconds and being able to give the answer to the user. What this also meant to gain that level of performance was also having a platform that could scale up in terms of performance and compute power on an unlimited basis. We also, over and above that, wanted to apply the latest AI machine learning technologies and techniques, but also apply simulation based on a gaming platform called Unity, which also consumes uh, a lot of compute power. So when we look at the appropriate platform and the environment to bring all of these different permutations of technologies and, and data sets together, we chose GCP as our preferred platform. With the help of our Google colleagues, we were then able to develop these solutions mainly into two applications. One, the asset criticality application, and number two, the timetable simulator application, both of which was enabling Network Rail to improve the way timetables were planned and developed and being able to test it before they go live to, to in, ensure that there's no disruptions to the network, but also identify the most critical assets and apply maintenance, th therefore avoiding failures that will incur disruptions to the, the network. Network Rail has been using these two applications for a while now uh, and been ga gaining the, the benefits of being able to optimize the way timetables are run and developed and assets are maintained. But in order to bring this to life, I want to show you some videos of these two products that we have developed. Hopefully this will bring to life the actual use case that I have just explained to you. What you now see on the screen is the asset criticality application. You are seeing the network between Clapham Junction and Waterloo in London where all of the critical assets on that network is highlighted. This application, by combining the utilization of the network, i.e. timetable and the actual train running information, uniquely with the asset information, and also taking into account the impact of a failure of a particular asset on the operations of the network, be able to give an index of what the most critical assets on that network are. Going beyond that, on the next video clip, what you're seeing is the predictive uh, module that tells you the assets that needs maintenance immediately. On the top right-hand corner of this graph, you see 
these assets need maintenance now and without applying maintenance they are likely to fail in the near future and thereby disrupting the network. However, this application does a lot more than that. If you look at the bottom left hand side of this graph, it also shows you assets that are not being used at all or very infrequently used. Having assets that are not fully utilized on a network is an equally uh, a problem for network operators. In this case, Network Rail is able to either remove these assets completely or to apply a lower level of a, a maintenance regime because using this application, they can now know how much these assets are being utilized by the actual services that runs on them. The next video you're seeing is the actual timetable simulation module where we use and apply two techniques to test the robustness of a planned timetable. In the first instance, we take the timetable and look at five years worth of historic data and apply machine learning technologies to see how this timetable can be optimized and to avoid any real disruptions to the, the network. Once you've got an optimized timetable, we then allow that to be run inside a simulation environment where the physics of the real world is being tested. This is done by using a gaming technology platform and its physics engine to see how a timetable can be operated simultaneously uh, for a day's worth of services or, or even for a week or a month worth of services. This will tell Network Rail how robust and tolerant this timetable for small disruption or failures or incidents in the, net, uh, in the network can be. As you can see, these products and solutions have continued to deliver uh, benefits in running the UK railway network for network rail. And in developing this solution, we were very much helped not only by our Cape data science and the, the engineers that we have within Deloitte, but also uh, by our colleagues from Google. So to tell you a little bit about how Google approaches these type of problems, the tools and the platforms they employ, but also to talk a little bit about how Google approaches the transport sector, I'm now going to hand you over to Paula to take you through their presentation. Thank you. So thanks, Anadu and Andrew. Really interesting to hear about um, Network Rail and some of the solutions that have been put in place. So in this section, I'm going to look a bit at some of the technology that was used, but also some of the opportunity that's there to improve public transport using um, Google Cloud Platform. So, the opportunity. Really, AI, there's a huge opportunity for all public services. And the way in which it can help public services is really about improving data-driven decisions, improving the speed of decisions and improve, improving the impact that they have. And those could be real time, they could be in the moment, but they could also be more about planning and thinking about our approach to operations and what if type analysis. And together, those things are very powerful. They can also help us improve the scale and help us to actually serve more passengers to actually use the trains effectively. One of the questions that we see on a lot of passengers' minds today is can they travel safely? So we will also look at this as part of this section. So the next slide is the Google Cloud AI adoption framework. So in our experience, if you focus just on the technology alone, you won't be successful. You need to consider the people who are going to implement it. 
you need to consider the data that's part of the algorithms and the process that's going to govern it and all the things that are interrelated and in between. So those are our six themes. So let's look at those. The first is learning. Obviously, skills are really important, hiring good talent. And as we've seen, having a partner work with you can help in terms of providing some of that expertise. Leadership. So looking at your business strategy and thinking how can AI support your business strategy is really vital, as well as having strong sponsorship and leadership for your projects. Access to data is key. That's often a blocker for projects. They don't have access to the right data. And secure in this context is about using AI responsibly. And it's also about data security and data governance. Scale, we've heard a lot of mention of scale already. If we want to do data analytics and AI on large data sets and we want to have real-time responses, then this involves a lot of compute. So using managed services on GCP can really support this activity. And then we have automate. And automate is really important for innovation because what automate will do is allows to automate not just across development, but also operations, meaning that we can get things done a lot faster, but also in a way that's more predictable and more reliable. So this framework will help you to improve all of these capabilities. So let's have a look at technology. In this slide, there's an example of um, some geospatial visualisation. And for Network Rail, this was really important, the geospatial visualisation and the geospatial analytics. And there were three key technologies, and they were machine learning, big data, and simulations. So in terms of machine learning, you have three choices on GCP. You can use managed services um, as they are. This is very quick. You can be uh, do things super fast and it doesn't require a huge amount of skill or investment. However, um, you don't really have options to configure or, or customise. So if you wanted to do some customised deployments, you would use AutoML. So for example, this could be you wanted to do some classification on images and come up with your own labels. This would mean that you didn't actually have to write any code. You could do it all through the user interface. It would choose the right algorithm for you. So you can still do things quite fast, but you can add your own configuration. And then finally, we have bespoke end-to-end -end AI solutions. And these are the ones that can solve the most complex problems. And um, they also require the most skill and the most investment. So um, for example, one of the technologies that Deloitte used was Neo4j to do graph databases on GCP. In terms of big data, we have BigQuery is our managed service for big data. This can scale to hundreds of petabytes. It's also serverless, so you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You can just bring your data to it and analyze it. For public transport, one of the things that makes it particularly useful is it can ingest tens of millions of events. This means you can respond in the moment, but you can also use historical data to give context to those decisions. And then finally, we mentioned AI simulations. This is a really big trend at the moment. This is seen increasingly important. And this was one of the technologies that was used to help with the timetabling. And in the context of GCP, we use the Unity gaming um, technology in combination with GCP. And this allows us to have lots of different scenarios with lots of different parameters and to see what happens. So in the next section, I just wanted to talk about some of the trends we're seeing in transport currently. So the box on the top, detect conditions, this is all about better understanding the density of passengers. So understanding how many passengers are on platforms or how many passengers are using PPE. Are people social distancing? Typically, for these sorts of solutions, we'd recommend that people start with the data they already have and create a business index. But we could also add instrumentation to the solution um, further down the line. The box on the bottom is all about passengers, making sure they're well informed, 
making sure they can understand what the new procedures are, can they travel, what the things do they have to do differently, but also employees, because we need to make sure that employees are safe in the current situation. The box on the right, Generate Insights, is looking at things like passenger sentiment, but also helping us anticipate demand. So, for example, by using searches as a proxy to understand where people might travel. On the left, we have Manage Operations. We've heard a lot about predictive maintenance already, but this could also be some more tactical things. So it could also just be some small solutions around inspection um, or inventories of sort of cleaning materials, things like that. So all of these, we've got starter solutions today. A lot of them you can build quite quickly in a matter of weeks. I wanted to finish on a case study. The slide actually shows you um, a map, a visualisation from the case study. And this was with Colorado Department of Transportation. They were actually experiencing issues around fatalities on the roads. They've done a lot of work to reduce fatalities successfully, but they had started to see an increase and their budgets were being reduced. They couldn't build more roads. So what we helped them do was look at the road as a source of information to help solve that problem. They had lots of data, but it was very disparate. It wasn't connected. So we helped them to connect it in one place and combine it with Waze data, which is crowdsourced data, and also with Google Maps. And this enabled them to make much better decisions to improve safety, to reduce costs, do more with less and actually improve the service that they were offering. So in this section, we've had a look at some of the technology, how to improve capabilities and also some of the transport trends. So what I wanted to do was hand over now to Andy and Nat uh, for the next section. Thank you, Paula. And thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Nadin. Really, really interesting session. We've got some questions actually coming in uh, from the audience, so let's try and pick a couple out. Okay, first question. It sounds great that we're able to use simulation to drive operational efficiency in the railways, but how can we use it to better inform customers who are traveling at the time? What do you think, guys? Oh, that's a great question. Um... For me, simulation is really a tool about um, answering or getting to some uncertain uh, environments. So simulation isn't really the answer for customers. What customers are after is good information to answer the questions that they have at any moment in time. Um, and it's all more about being uh, able to deliver customers the right information at the right time. So perhaps we can use simulation to create scenarios that understands or generates a better picture of how customers are impacted at certain moments in time. And if we can understand the questions they're going to ask, then we can understand better the data that they're going to need to answer those questions uh, when, when those situations do occur. Yeah, and just to add to what Andrew said, I think when the railway is running normally, there is not, uh, there isn't a need to do lots of simulations, but especially when there is an incident and a, for example, part of the railway is uh, blocked, that's when simulation technologies will really come into play. Uh, we have looked at developing uh, applications using simulation to help not only the operators to decide which uh, routes, optimal routes to redirect, uh, trains uh, to guide staff and, and relieve staff to place them in the right place at the right time in order to recover the network, but equally to answer the question around passengers, this is also a, a great opportunity uh, by using simulations to uh, guide customers and passengers uh, to, to take alternative action in terms of uh, getting to their destination. So. Simulation really works when there are a number of different possible outcomes and needing to, uh, through simulation, to determine what's the most likely outcome and the most optimal outcome and thereby guiding the people. I think I'll add on top of that as well, we're doing in the, 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 the data that customers are going to like to need um, 
is often locked away in the current operational technology space. And we're really talking about shifting data around through information technology. Simulations can do can put up with, um, how should we say, constructed data in order to facilitate them. Passengers need real data. So we're going to have to overcome the OT, IT convergence challenge and, and work out ways in which we can extract real and real time data out of those systems that's valuable to the customers as well. Thank you. That's very helpful, the answer to that question. Um, we're getting a lot come through around technology, uh, around graph databases. Um, so I'm going to try and um, pull that into, into one question. So um, with the use of graph uh, databases and simulation techniques and, and the approaches, what have you found the most useful thing in that approach you took and some of the key lessons learned and insights from that? Anyone want to start with that one? Uh, I might not give you the answer that you're expecting here because um, for me, sort of all these technologies, they're just and techniques, they're tools and techniques to, to, to get a job done. Um, and there's often many, many ways in, in which you can achieve a job or to, to achieve a positive outcome. Um, I think the key for me is that it's about choosing the right tools for the job to maximize um, the, the resources that you have at hand. And secondly, it's about having the right people, the right skills to use those tools as well. Uh, it's, it, there's, there's no point having a great tool, tool set if you don't have the skills to use them. So um, on top of that, it's really about the mindset of being inquiring. And that's, 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 that was a big thing for me, is that, that questioning culture, that continuous improvement, and uh, questioning and, and, and striving for the right answers. I'll go a bit geeky over what Andy said <laughs> by graph databases. Um, as you might, some of you might know, graph databases are all about solving network related problems since the graph theory was uh, created a long time ago. Um, so, given railways are all about networks and the optimization of it, storing network related information in a graph database is the most optimal way to uh, not only store the information but having stored the information to apply different types of uh, algorithms on top of it there are numerous algorithms that helps us to optimize uh, networks but also to uh, do recovery of failed networks and various other things that that we need to perform on top of this data uh, and having your base information uh, on a graph database enables you to apply all of those graph theory based uh, networks to come up with advanced uh, techniques and advanced analytics to solve this complex problem. So uh, anything to do with the operational railway, uh, graph databases are the best most performant uh, tools to use to solve those problems? Yes, they're both fantastic answers. Um, I think they are very exciting technologies because they help us solve different sorts of problems. So, um, for example, simulations can help us think about pedestrians and how they move in crowds and how to organise our sort of urban form so it's more safe, or um, simulations could be used for looking at roads and trying to model lanes in roads but also they use a lot by scientists so for example CERN the Higgs boson um, work that they did was actually using simulations so they can help us do some really complex problems and really exciting things but yeah Andrew's totally right it's about doing solving the right problem and having the right skills as well. Thanks everyone really good answer thank you so I think we've got time for one final question let's have a look Okay, this one's about team and culture. So what capabilities in your team do you really need in place to be able to develop and deliver simulation projects? Who wants to take that one? Mm, another, another deep question. Um, <laughs> for me, actually, it's more about um, asking the, being able to ask the right questions. Um, and being comfortable 
and knowing your business so that you can actually ask the right questions. On top of that, being comfortable that you may have asked the wrong question and that's okay. Um, the whole point of going into the, the simulation environment is that uh, you're, it's a learning process, so you must be confident and comfortable with failing. Um, and that's not necessarily uh, a common attribute in an engineering environment um, where excellence is, is top of the list. So um, I think on top of that for me, um, it's diversity as well. So it's, it's, it's about diversity of thinking and diversity of problem solving and being prepared to uh, be able to manage an environment where you've got such diverse um, mindsets um, in order to maximize your problem solving capabilities. So it, it's, a, it's a long way away from talking about simulation as a tool directly. It's all about managing people and creating the environment where excellence can take place. Yeah, so yeah, I definitely agree with all the points that, that Andrew's made, you know, understanding that problem and breaking it down is really important. Um, the, I actually, in my presentation, I talked about the Google AI adoption framework, and that actually lists um, six things. I think I neglected to talk about the leadership one, which was really important, which was, you know, looking at your business strategy relating to that, but also having strong um, business sponsorship, um, but yeah, having the right technical skills, but also having diversity and inclusion in the team, all things that, that will make a difference. Um, all really great points on both uh, Andrew and Paula. The, the thing I would add on top would be when we are faced with solving problems like this, the culture and the, the, the techniques and the methodology that we establish becomes really uh, important. These are not problems that you can solve on a sequential linear basis. Um, and therefore using techniques like agile a methodology where we do things iteratively, uh, really in a fast cycles of coming up with different ideas, different uh, solutions and testing them to see which one is the right, uh, uh, you know, the most optimal solution for those problems is important. So on top of that methodology, therefore, having that diverse team of people, having that mindset, I think is really important. Um, and then secondly, I, I think for especially clients uh, like Andrew and Network Rail, what we as consultants do really uh, consciously is as we develop and helping to develop these solutions, we always insist on working with people who are on, on the client side uh, who would uh, not only, you know, where we would transfer our knowledge, but make sure that whatever we build with our assistance in that short period of time becomes a sustainable, maintainable solution going forward and transferring that uh, capability to the client individuals as well. So it's, it's about that mindset of doing things very quickly on an iterative basis but also thinking about the sustainability and the viability of future problem solving as well. Thank you all for another insightful answer and for an inspiring session today. Um, so once again, thank you, Paula, Andrew and Nadine for your time. Um, I'm afraid no more time for questions now, but we will get back to you with the answers to the ones you've posed so far. And if you do have any other questions, please email us at the Experience Analytics email address. Join us at 10 a.m. tomorrow, where we're going to have NatWest Markets, Data IQ, talking about how they're using analytics to revolutionize the trading floor. So that's it. Time's up. The train is leaving the station. And all I've got to say is it's a goodbye from Natalie Williams. And it's a goodbye from Andy Gould, still wearing trousers. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>